at that time i only remember that i was always thinking of beethoven in terms of somebody um physically um unattractive or ugly mm-hmm. but uh, certainly noble otherwise mm-hmm. as a personality and as a musician and uh, i remember i was told stories about his life and that was one of the uh, strangest and uh, most powerful um, musical images um, mu- um, image of uh, musical personality of that time of my life because uh, two things w- which are seemingly um in a contradiction uh, were combined uh, in an image of um, within an image of um, uh, that genius later when i was already a student and when i was in um, a different country when i was in soviet union studying there at the school i was discovering other beauties in music and i remember that since one of my close friends at that time was a violinist i was listening very often to the recording of uh, haifetz and that was the poem of um, chausson <laughs> you know very well it is a fantastic no. recording and um, uh, i remember that well music was coming really once i was in a performance of um, benjamin britten uh, works in uh, moscow he was a guest at that time and um, such soloists as Svetoslav Richter and uh, Mstislav Rostropovich and were participating in that special week of events and otherwise it would be just a, a concert with some new piece of music which i haven't heard before or mm-hmm. something like that or, or a special interpretation recently i was in japan in a, city called Fukuoka and I heard a phenomenal performance of uh, um, Claudio Abbado with the London Symphony Orchestra. You never know when when you are ready to start to like uh, music. I believe it's like meeting a person. It's Did you ever think he felt that you were born to play the piano itself? Well, a predestination to that instrument. Recently I spoke to somebody in Salzburg who asked me after the concert the same question. I said perhaps I was not sure. Well, it it was not perhaps uh, the piano which I thought I was born for. But certainly I knew and I'm sure now I'm sure that it was relatively early when i realized that i would like to to be able once upon a time to um recreate or better say um to give to people make a live uh, um open that nice part of of my personality so in other words i knew that in one or other form i wanted to to be an artist because mm-hmm. <laughs> that is yes you understood what means you had to, to be an artist <laughs> this is what what it yeah. is to be an artist because you you believe that you have something um inside which is perhaps nicer than um than your surroundings which yes. is nicer than your uh, everyday life and which under special circumstances should should get exposed now what about your everyday life in yugoslavia was it a good life were you encouraged 
and so forth? Well, it was a difficult life because um, while other children, I suppose, were enjoying um, the time after the school, I was always committed to go to practice. And for me, it was terrible mm -hmm. because um, at that age, you really don't understand how much uh, you are going to appreciate that time later mm -hmm. because uh, you are already... <clears throat> at the ad advantage um, advantageous uh, side while others um, are left behind you because yeah. you have you have done something in advance you have done yeah. uh, well you know it's an interesting thing being a pianist one doesn't start at the age of 20 and so many parents let's say who say well i'll give my uh i'll give evo piano lessons but uh oh i can't do it until 11 they have already thrown it away so to speak yes well but this is what the advantage is you should start not because you want it but because of um the wish of uh, other people in that case it may be your parents or uh, somebody who encouraged you and you are not aware of what uh, it is going to bring uh, you later because you have to make um, it you have to make up your mind and you have to um, to later discover the value of the early work when was it precisely that you made up your mind that f not just being an artist that you were going to for the rest of your life, practice the piano five <laughs> hours a day. That was when I first discovered how difficult it is to be good and how much you have to fight for it and how much you have to work for it. But you wanted it to was fight in for Moscow. it. It was in Moscow. Uh -huh. Well, it was when I saw other people, when I saw um, other children. But at that time, I was 11 when I went We're to study. We're going to start our program with a performance by a Russian composer, Prokofiev. Now, you, did you study at the Moscow Conservatory? Yes, but before I studied at the special school. Yes. Younger. For five years, Younger. yes, which is... Uh, uh, Was Prokofiev considered in Russia at that time you were studying one of the giants and a composer for the piano of real special qualities? Yes, although I don't think they can really play him they do they play Prokofiev better than others mm -hmm. in uh, Soviet Union because he lived um, for part of uh, 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 his life in um, first in Russia and then he was abroad and then uh, um, he died in uh, in Soviet Union and some of his uh, works were dedicated to current um, um, successful young pianists at that time yes. it was um, Emil Gilles and Svetoslav Richter yeah. who were honored such a great honor well I think it was Richter possibly or Prokofiev himself on a radio broadcast that gave the first performance of the sixth sonata that was written during the war uh, World War the beginning of World but War II but perhaps Richter was um, the one um, whom uh, we owe um, uh -huh. the popularity of that sonata more even than to the composer himself. But, um, <laughs> well... When did you come to him? How did he form a part of your musical life, Prokofiev? Very early. I was given two pieces from the Romeo and Juliet cycle when I was 11 and um, I made a successful performance with them and I started to like very much because at that time of course my musical aesthetics were not uh, at the level that I should um, philosophically or I uh, understand it in, in any other way but just as two wonderful full of character pieces of music I played Montecchi and Capuletti I remember mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, <laughs> and the other one Mercutio mm -hmm. <laughs> now is Prokofiev in your 12 years ago is Prokofiev in your mind one of the major composers for the piano of this century 
not only of the piano. I think that uh, of all the valuable music from this century, the most valuable comes from Prokofiev. The most valuable? Yes. That's quite my, a statement, Ivo. Absolutely. I, I put him um, before Stravinsky. and uh, I think Before that, Bartok? Yes, before Bartok, because although Bartok ended his life too early to be in a position to match Prokofiev in in uh, perhaps range and quantity of of uh, musical compositions uh, left behind, um, Bartok died too early. The last pieces uh, of music. Uh, w- from Bartok are absolutely outstanding and uh, one of them the sonata for two pianos and percussions Mm -hmm. is um, the piece of music which um, I'm going to prepare together with uh, my wife Mm -hmm. in order to perform in concerts and to make a recording that is a piece of music which I personally consider the treasury of of the century. But yes. Prokofiev in general is absolutely because uh, not only that um, he's unique and that each part of his music is um, easy to recognize, but also because uh, uh, he was the opposition to all the modern uh, waves and all the modern. Uh, uh, trends in music at at the time because he was still considering melody and harmony to be two major. Um, he never went into the twelve tone method. No, no, it's not necessary. Yeah. When you are um, so gifted and when you are a genius, it's not necessary to invent uh, anything or to 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 change. Uh, your so, in a certain way, Ivo, you're a traditionalist. You're not about to play avant-garde music tomorrow all over. Well, why not? I played the music of somebody who was considered avant-garde. He died as well, Jolivet. Sure. And uh, I think it's a a wonderful music, but if I wish to compare uh, music of Jolivet to music of Prokofiev, I just find it's not the same pair of gloves. Yeah. It's just... um, Well, you know, you're going to take your gloves off right this minute to play for us (laughs) the first movement of that gigantic Prokofiev Sixth Sonata. It's a wonder of a work. It's in four movements. We're going to hear the first movement in your hands. It's on a digital Deutsche Grammophone record, and if you want to buy it, 2532093. I seldom give the record numbers, but in your case... I want everyone to have this record. If I may add a bit to it, um, um, I'm very pleased and honored that that would be the first choice for, the, for this program. For um, um, It's not only that um, I'm devoted to the music of Prokofiev, but also to the personality of that man who had an extremely um, difficult uh, life and who was not uh, understood um, when alive. His last years were very difficult, Prokofiev, no doubt Extremely about it. Extremely yeah. difficult. He was uh, living um, in an um, environment where um, many people were against him and when yeah. he was, where he was representing uh, something dangerous, uh, considered to be dangerous at that time. I'm doing my best in... Um, um, something which has nothing to do directly uh, or immediately with his music, but but with what has to do with uh, his personality and his life. Um, I happened to met to meet um, the widow of uh, Prokofiev, yes. um, Madame Lina Prokofiev, in Paris after my my concert in April and. Uh, at um, present, uh, we are trying to do something for um, for a small, at this moment small, but hopefully it will grow for a foundation. The Prokofiev Foundation? Pro- Prokofiev Foundation. That's wonderful. Which would be perhaps um, an institution... Um, 
to serve as to encourage people to understand better his music and mm-hmm. play better his music to promote him yes so because, little of his music is really known because, because i think it is yes it is um uh, untrue and it is um in um in some ways unfortunate that uh, his music uh, is uh, played by pianists for not the real value in it not the real meaning but for the side effects of it because um suppose you need to go to participate in a competition then you would certainly choose the seventh sonata because mm-hmm. if you can play technically you will get better uh, <laughs> so certain brilliant aspects are used superficially by many people i think so just yeah. uh, f- just because of the the side uh, the side effects of of the music ivo we're now going to hear your performance of the prokofiev 6th sonata the first movement you have just heard the new recording by Ivo Pogorelish of the Prokofiev 6th Piano Sonata's first movement. Right after this message, we'll be right back with more conversation. We are back, Ivo. You are playing the piano everywhere. You're in Salzburg, you're in uh, San Francisco, you're at Tanglewood. Um, is this a strain because of the jet lag is are you unhappy with all of the performances that you have to give do you fear becoming in a way a piece of merchandising where you have to be here and you have to be there and you really will become ragged have you ever thought of that i don't have to you don't have to what play i don't have to play if i don't want it is the way of life that you've chosen that i've yes that i've chosen and not only that i've chosen but it is the way of life which changes because for instance this month it can be an amount of um, of concerts and next month it can be nothing just mm-hmm. relax uh, mm-hmm. relaxation no? sometimes it's hard because you have uh, inconvenient um, flights and then the weather suddenly changes and you the verses if you have to do the work and you don't feel well if you mm-hmm. have um, besides um, the commercial aspect well we can speak for hours about the commercial aspect i think that in this part of the century um music and commerce are part of each other because um, you can no longer separate um uh, one f- from another you can't um make concerts in the world unless you are a part of the international um playing elite unless you are a part of the international system and the international system is unthinkable um without the international recording system and that is again un- unthinkable uh without such um, musical radio programs which we do at this moment sure so all of that is impossible without a uh, suitable start uh of the career which in my case were international competitions and which in most of the cases um still are uh so that is the inevitable evil of our um, profession and then all of that is still yet impossible without a good training and without a good so, so it's a complex of 20 years perhaps more than 20 years before you are the fortunate one to represent a certain quality and a certain value in the work you do then of course you are immediately honored and you are appreciated and you are famous and you are talked about and you are um envied and uh, people are jealous about you and you are a star sure. and then you are asked whether you like to make concerts or not you see so your question my question <laughs> is, is your your answer is the kind of answer i like to a question because it is a complicated question and think of the f- this Perhaps there is an Ivo Pogorelish 
with a talent like yours, and he is somewhere, and he's not going to win a contest because he cannot have that extra thing in him that can go out to the world. So we'll never really know about him then, will we? Because it's a, such an internationally complex subject. No, but we must also think about so many people who are extremely talented, but they just don't have a power to become artists, because to be an artist is not only to be a talented musician. I will ask you this question. My guest today is Ivo Pogorelis, and the question is, you mentioned the word jealousy. Does it bother you that now that you are a star, that your photograph is everywhere, that people will envy you and they'll say, oh, he doesn't deserve this, I do, or whatever? Well, I don't know if it bothers me, but certainly... In some cases, it already affected uh, my life, and in some cases, my private life, or mm -hmm. whatever. I had some troubles with people who, without whom the career is impossible, uh, people who are next um, uh, to the artists and who are following, uh, like agents, like managers. Like I had troubles also because of my age because I do something which people would not expect you to do unless you are 35, 40, 50 years What do you old. mean by that? I mean that um, they wouldn't really associate the quality um, uh -huh. and the achievement. Yes, you shouldn't play Opus like, 111 at yes, 22. Yes they, would like to, yes, they would like to find it odd. They would like to find it um, impossible yes. because that... Uh, that is something which they wouldn't like to accept because they perhaps were not able to do it when, when they were of, of that age. But um, many things, when, um, when you have very little friends, when you have people who, um, uh, although appreciate and who are happy to be seen and who, who are happy to meet you and, and uh, who don't, spend time trying to understand, trying to really look a bit in, inside and just mm, trying to help you in, in a way because mm -hmm. anyone needs friends and anyone needs people who... I don't know... Did you have people turn against you that were friends? Yes, many. This is a horrible thing. Many, yes. Well, but what can you do? It's a reality. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, you mean envy and jealousy mm. is a reality? It's an absolute reality mm -hmm. in life. Uh, I'll ask you this question now. Because, For me, yeah. personally, it doesn't mean anything because I don't really pay attention. And from the time I was a child, I, I was not... Um, I never... I was never curious what others think of, of me, and that's perhaps what, what helped me. I, so you can go I was your following, own way. I was following my own rhythm in life, yes. and I do it now. But I'm wondering if others, if very valuable and talented people were not victims of, of things like that. Yes, absolutely. You knew somebody personally. Perhaps it would have been of um, a greater interest for me to know him <laughs> rather than for you. Well, um, perhaps I'm a little bit Im impertinent, but um, I'm a pianist and he was um, one of the greatest uh, talents of the century, Glenn Gould. Yes. But uh, would you not think that he was affected by similar symptoms? Similar? I think that one of the problems, Ifo, that led him to seclusion was he was, in the long run, too sensitive Exactly. To go out there every day. Exactly. Not only to go out there, but to meet those who look and smile. And once you, you turn your, your spine to them, speak against you and do against you, he, he was lacking, he was lacking um, um, perhaps a bit of... Um, of the um, soldier, because mm -hmm. you have to be a soldier in your life, not only a general, but sometimes a soldier. Yes. You, you must be. And I think he, he, he was not 
aware of, of his uh, weakness and uh, his um, delicacy because he was a very delicate personality. Far more than we know, and I think this is why he's... But far greater mistake I, to me, I, again, I must uh, say I didn't know him personally, a uh, far greater mistake was not to look for associates, not to look for somebody who could be of, 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 of any support to mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is for others to judge, but this is my impression. We're going to talk more about Glenn Gould, but right now on this program we have to play some music, and it's going to be your performance of a beautiful nocturne which is only now coming into its own in the last maybe decade, and that's the Opus 55, number two of Chopin, the nocturne in E-flat, and the performance on a Deutsche Grammophon recording of all Chopin is my guest today, Ivo Pogorelish. it. Okay, let's start. Well, next time when you have more time, we will do more shows. <laughs> we'll do 10. <laughs> okay. All right. This is David Dubal, and we now return after the performance of the Chopin E-flat Nocturne. My guest, the Yugoslavian-born artist, pianist, Ivo Pogorelish. Well, we were talking about Glenn Gould, and we interrupted that, and I would like to go back to that on another program when you are back in New York. Right now, I would like to speak, since we just heard the music of the poet of the piano, you must be very involved with Chopin, his music, his personality, and everything about him. Am I correct? It's true. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, because of that particular quality of his music that you can't listen to it and be indifferent to it. You can't... Whenever you listen, even when it is badly played... Yes. And he <laughs> is, is badly played often, isn't he? <laughs> I think he is badly played most of the time. Mm -hmm. But um, the music is still winning and the music is still uh, there. That is the quality which... <laughs> when did you come to the Chopin etudes in your musical education? When I was 12. What were they like to you? Very difficult. Were you very happy to be learning these now? Well, I don't know whether I was um, happy um, with them or not, but certainly they were representing quite... a. Um, great deal of, of uh, difficulty. And, uh, and in advance, everyone probably said to you, this is yes, a big thing. Yes, and not only that, and others were playing them, and uh, in our school, those who played Chopin etudes were considered uh, to be good, and others to mm -hmm. be bad, and so it was yeah. <laughs> a, um, a social, um, uh, local um, symbol of prestige. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> as it is a badge of prestige, Ivo, at this time in history for every pianist to play the Gaspar de Lanoui. Ah, well, it is not only a badge. <laughs> I think it is an achievement because yes. very few can really uh, even uh, cover what it has to be covered by playing every note from the text, yes. <laughs> which is incomparably uh, difficult. But I, mm, I doubt very much if Gaspar is really for... Uh, for um, anyone to dare to play, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in uh, in that um, there must be a certain um, respect, a certain confidence, and responsibility um, for a pianist to open the score of that and say, "Well, I will now start to study that mm -hmm. piece." And it's Gaspar. so great a work <laughs> for for the not only the music but for the layout of the instrument itself that that when a, you say that a pianist must just 
be respectful. You can't just decide, I'm going to learn Gaspar. No, but also you have to to be a master for it. I don't know whether in the United States the critics who are listening to that record and who are uh, giving their uh, opinions in the press, whether they are aware of the achievement which I, which was my uh, personal uh, um, one in, in that piece and um, that was to make the music sound as if the orchestra played it. Von mm -hmm. Karajan was the one to to gave me the compliment um, in which he said it was not the piano, it was an orchestra. Oh, that's fantastic. Ivo, you know, we do not have time. If we continue to talk, the audience will not get within this hour to hear one of the great performances of Scarbo of all time, yours. I know you're smiling. Thank and you. And I know you want to hear it yourself because you probably don't even remember it. But I want it's to say... It's better to listen to that rather than to what we talk about. Oh, not true. Well, perhaps you're right. That's what this program is about. But we want to also get a flavor of you as a personality. We're going to hear Scarbo, the last movement of Gaspar Dylan Wee of Maurice Ravel, and it is on your newest, I believe, digital recording on Deutsche Grammophon, that wonderful label, and it's 2532093 if you want to buy it. Again, I want to say we're going to hear the piece. Thank you. You have just heard an extraordinary performance of Scarbo one of the great goblins in the piano literature. I always called it the 13th list transcendental etude, Evo. When you come back to New York, please give me some more time so we can go through your discography and discuss more things. Thanks for coming. Thank you. This is David Dubal. Thank you for listening. <laughs>